Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. First up today, we have a new proposed class action lawsuit that was filed yesterday, alleging that Tesla has monopolized the service and repair aspect when it comes to Teslas. The suit is saying Tesla is leveraging its market power to restrain repair and maintenance services, and they're also complaining that you can really only go through a Tesla service center or a Tesla approved service center, and you can mainly only use Tesla parts to do repairs. This is a very very complicated and nuanced topic. I would just add Tesla's main pushback is that they can't just open up the repair to anybody with any parts because Teslas are very unique vehicles with a lot more technology and there's a lot more that can go wrong for people that don't know how to work on these vehicles. Two years ago in Massachusetts, there was an initiative to try to include telematics data to open that up to any third party service center to which Tesla said that would make vehicles more vulnerable to cyber attacks and would make successful attacks more harmful. Over the years, Tesla has made some progress in this area by doing things like opening up their parts catalog to the general public a few years back. They've also compiled and opened up this Tesla do-it-yourself guide, so if you want to work on your Tesla on your own, you can do so. It may just be difficult to get parts, but that's not always the case. Personally, I'm not a DIY guy. I would rather go to a Tesla service center or one that's approved by Tesla, even if it means paying a little bit more to have somebody that should know what they're doing on my vehicle. And no, I'm not saying Tesla service is perfect. It's just a nuanced conversation. I know there are plenty of people on the other side of this debate. Let me know below, but we'll see how this one plays out. In response to now Tesla fly, Elon said V11 starts going wide this weekend. So fingers crossed. It sounds like version 11.3.1 that already went out to internal employees that has been widened to the early access beta testers, maybe a thousand or so people, will now this weekend start rolling out to an additional 350 or 400,000 people in time. Tesla confirmed the first V4 supercharger stalls are now open in the Netherlands. These stalls are equipped with a longer cable, but no word on how long exactly. Currently, V4 stalls are only open to Tesla vehicles as they test and evaluate these, they'll soon welcome all EVs at this site and open new V4 sites across Europe. Here's a cool night shot of that location from Fritz, still no word on the actual performance. Speaking of performance, Tesla said over the last five years we've unlocked 30% faster charge times through a combination of hardware, software, and customer education. Tesla is pulling this off with a more efficient trip planner and don't forget they said that they're going to use real-time data so when somebody is driving to a supercharger location but they're not going to get there for the next whatever five or 30 minutes they will include that person at the station so if you are also planning to go to the same place you'll know that they're also planning to be there I think that's pretty awesome and I would also just point out that there is a cyclicality that comes into play with supercharging times toward the end of each year the time to supercharge goes back up I would imagine that's due to colder weather and ultimately slower charging times maybe more people at the chargers you know, holiday travel, colder weather, that would be my guess. How about this nonsense? It looks like the governor of Mississippi actually pulled the trigger and signed that bill we were talking about into law. So now an electric vehicle manufacturer cannot sell an EV in person unless they open up a franchise dealership. Governor Tate Reeves says almost 200 small businesses in communities across our state are seeking assurances that big manufacturers can't just destroy their businesses. That's fair. Yeah, I don't know about that. Sounds a lot more like political posturing and protectionism, if you ask me. So now if someone in Mississippi wanted to buy a Tesla in person, they would have to drive to the one store in the state that's in Brandon. But now going forward, Tesla or any other EV manufacturer, if they want to sell cars in person in the state, they have to open a dealership model. Hopefully residents of Mississippi will be perturbed by this and they'll want to get out of this dealership model even more because we all know that the dealership model is not actually what's best for the consumer, quite the contrary. Josh West gave us a quick video update saying he's at the Tesla Service Center in Mississauga in Canada, one of the biggest ones up there, and he's doing the first CCS adapter retrofit. 
Remember for now, it's just the older Model S and X vehicles that are eligible. The Model 3 and Y retrofits won't be available until later this year. The refreshed Model S and X have officially made their return to the Chinese and really global market now. It's been about two years since Tesla shut down those production lines to refresh these vehicles. Jay in Shanghai saying about 867 cars arrived at the port over the last few days, and it's expected these deliveries will take place this month. And yes, the word on the street is these customers were able to choose whether they wanted a round steering wheel or the yoke. I'll be honest, it's still a little unsettling to me how many people don't know that in 2023, all of their online activity is being tracked and stored and sometimes that data is even being sold on the black market. Data is the new gold and without some form of online protection, you are exposing yourself to these practices. And as a small business owner, I'm a prime candidate for these phishing emails and offers and that's only part of why I'm still using Surfshark in 2023. Surfshark is the sponsor of this video and it's a VPN that can give you your online privacy back so no one can see what you're doing and no one can share or sell any of your private information. Look, for a few dollars a month to have one of the most reputable and feature-rich VPNs protecting all of my online activity and making it private, it's a no-brainer if you ask me. It also cleans up those annoying websites that have ads everywhere, and this is done using Surfshark's clean web feature. If you use my link in the description below, you can get 83% off and three extra months for free. Surfshark also offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So there's honestly no risk to try it for yourself. And yes, it's a great way to support the channel. Adam Jonas and Morgan Stanley put out an eight page note on heat pumps. I just wanna share a few quick points of new information we learned. They have an EU team that's been covering this company in the heat pump space, we'll call it NIBE. This company generated gross margin over 30% and EBIT margins for its climate solution division in the 13 to 16% range over the last 10 years. And they're saying this NIBE company has around 40% of the group sales of heat pumps that are primarily being sold in Sweden. For context, Tesla's auto gross margins most recently were around 27%. So if this NIBE company is pulling off over 30% gross margins with the heat pump, that could give you some sort of idea what Tesla could do in the future if they go through with this product. Obviously, heat pumps are already in Tesla vehicles. I'm referring to Tesla Home HVAC. And something to keep in mind, according to calculations by McKinsey, low-income households can now get an $8,000 rebate versus no incentives, making a heat pump around 85% cheaper compared to gas furnaces. Without any incentives, the unit cost and the cost to install may on average be around $7,600, which would be a bit more than a typical AC unit. However, when you add in these incentives from the IRA, at least for the lower income households, those unit economics get completely flipped. The IEA has forecast the global heat pump market to go from about 190 million units in 2021 up to 600 million units by 2030, which works out to about a 14% compound annual growth rate. There's no guarantee Tesla gets into this business line, but I'm pretty confident they will sometime in the next 10 years. And for what it's worth, Morgan Stanley has $0 of valuation for this business line in their Tesla stock price target currently. We haven't talked much about BMW as of late, but it's time to run through a quick update. So two things to keep an eye on. One, their panoramic vision that they've been marketing a lot lately. It's essentially going to be a form of a heads up display, but this one may take up to some degree most of the windshield, customizable, showing you a lot of information so you can keep your eyes on the road. And BMW's new class line of EVs that is set to debut in 2025 is basically the new architecture specifically for electric vehicles from BMW. So this is a huge deal to their EV future. Last year, BMW's capital expenditures were $8.37 billion compared to Tesla's, which were just over $7 billion. And now we just talked about VW's planning to spend over $38 billion each year for the next five years. For this new class line of EV dedicated architecture, the first two models will be a sedan and an SUV with a similar footprint to the current 3 Series. As mentioned, production of this new class line will begin in 2025 in Hungary. It'll then roll out to Germany in 26 
projects and sadly not in North America until 2027 where they'll be built in Mexico. BMW has mentioned exporting some of these cars from Hungary and Germany to North America before this North American production begins. We should get more detail on this new class line September of this year. BMW has talked about six production models based on this new class architecture between 25 and 2027. With this line, BMW is working on a structural battery pack and they are set to use cylindrical cells and there have been talks of using 4680s. BMW has said that it's significantly ahead of its EV sales goals and for Western markets, you may be familiar with the EV series I lineup. BMW expects one in three sales to be electric by 2026 and that number last year was one of 11. Lastly, BMW said it remains dedicated to hydrogen fuel cell technology. In Australia, people are now being charged fines for icing a charging location. Drivers could be fined as much as $3,200 for parking in spaces for electric vehicles and not using them. This applies to both ICE vehicles and electric vehicles that are just parked without actually charging. Listen to this one. VW is about to do what Tesla did not during its recent investor day, show off an affordable electric vehicle for the masses. They're giving a first glimpse of a compact hatchback that will start selling within a few years. This just gets back to the core of people just wanting to see a new shiny toy, regardless of if that company can actually make it and can make it profitably and can make it safe. They don't care about any of that stuff. They just want to see it with their eyes. And how about this absurd line that just goes to show you the lack of credibility of some of these journalists. It's only made minor cosmetic changes to the Model 3 since it went into production almost six years ago. Nothing about heat pumps or rear casting or new wiring or different hardware versions, but pretty much the same car for the last six years. Psych. Anyway, today VW is set to unveil this new hashtag VW for the people. The top eight EVs registered in January were all made in North America. Consumers obviously want to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act. This is not good for Hyundai and Kia. Hyundai's imported Ionic 5 fell to 9th place from 7th place for the full year of 2022, and the EV6 is no longer in the top 10 after it finished in 8th place for all of 2022. Speaking of Kia, I'm definitely rooting for them. This is their upcoming EV9, which I really think is going to serve an underserved part of the EV market, a big 7-seat practical vehicle for families and road trips and that American lifestyle. We don't yet have pricing. We don't have a lot of the specs just yet. Of course, that will matter greatly when it comes to sales, but there are some really cool features of this vehicle and I do actually like the styling a lot. For example, my parents want to go electric or they said they're open to it, but they need a bigger vehicle. They like to take road trips and there really isn't anything serving that space. This car will use an 800 volt architecture and Kia has said that eventually this vehicle will be built in Georgia so it will be eligible for the Inflation Reduction Act incentives at that time but Kia needs to get that up and running as soon as possible. One of those cool features is these fully customizable, fully swivelable, if that's a word, seats that give you a lot of flexibility. Tailgating, hanging out, pretty cool. So let me know what you guys think about the first look of the Kia EV9, yay or nay. We also got a very cool aerial shot of the projected expansion in Giga Berlin. This is from GF4 Tesla. So we're still unsure on the permits and the timelines. I'll keep you posted to the best of my ability, but here is an aerial view and it's not an insignificant expansion plan. I'll send you guys off today with some cool new pictures of the V4 supercharger from our friend Stephen Bank. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLoomis22. Hope you have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.